this. Um, so today we're talking about, the, or, or trying to answer the question, is inclusion enough? Um, and what I wanted to do before we, we tackle that question is just run you through a little bit of background about what brought us all here today and a little bit about the Debugging Diversity Project. So um, before we do that though, I should say a very, very special thank you to Canva who have provided this space for us today. It's a wonderful space. I have, I have only just been introduced to the new space. Um, and I'm sure you'll all agree, it's uh, pretty spectacular. I also wanted to say uh, a big thanks to Endframe and Start Webcast, who have been kind enough to run all of the live stream equipment and bring all of the gear in for us today and put in lots and lots of hours uh, last night to get everything set up. So thank you very much to everyone who's made that uh, possible. So this is a graph. And what is this graph showing you? This is showing you the number of, uh, or the percentage of women in the technology and engineering workforce over the last 10 or 15 years or so. And what we notice about this graph is, despite the fact that we're talking about gender diversity and technology and engineering a whole lot more than we were 10 or 15 years ago, that number isn't budging. Uh, so we started, as you can see, it's 30% roughly in 2003. Fast forward to 2017. These numbers were released by the National Center for Women and Technology um, in the US last year. So the relatively recent numbers. Um, and that, that um, participation rate has not been changing. So this is why one of the reasons we're going to continue talking about this. Uh, another point that I wanted to share with everybody is, despite the fact that coding actually is on the curriculum in every state of Australia and in, and in many parts of the US and in other parts of the world, it's still not taught in many schools. And why isn't it taught in many schools? Well, it's quite simple. There aren't enough teachers who know how to teach coding. So that's a major challenge, and that's a challenge we have to solve in our industry. And the last one that I wanted to share with you is uh, when the slide comes up. <clears throat> this is actually probably the most concerning of all of the things that we'll talk about today in terms of stats and figures. 41% of women will leave engineering at some point in their career. And before anyone says it, no, that's not because they're going off and having families. That's an additional uh, number of people that do unfortunately leave um, and sometimes find it difficult to return. But this is just people that leave, or women that leave in particular for these reasons. So they're treated unfairly, they're underpaid, they're less likely to be fast-tracked than their male colleagues and they're unable to advance. So that leads to a great deal of frustration. Uh, this, this is based on a report, by the way, by the Harvard Business Review. Uh, it was released a few years ago. So. What is Debugging Diversity? So Debugging Diversity is a film. Uh, it's something that myself and my co-producers uh, have been working on for about five years now. Uh, it's been a, a long process, a long journey of discovery and research and, and I guess self-reflection. Uh, and over that time, we've captured maybe 200 hours worth of footage. We have some incredible stories to share. But now, uh, as you may be aware, we're running an Indiegogo campaign to try and raise money to complete the project. Uh, so I wanted to share with you a little trailer um, about the film now. So, you'll have to imagine what the music sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I mentioned, uh, we're running an Indiegogo campaign at the moment. If you'd like to contribute uh, to that campaign, it's debuggingdiversity.com slash campaign. Uh, we're taking individual contributions from $25 and corporate contributions from $250. Uh, so, if you're interested in contributing, I uh, would be extremely grateful. Um, so, that leads us on to our first guest. So welcome, uh, Pauline Devasundram, uh, who's joining us. Uh, she's a tech lead from Canva, and she's going to have a little bit of a chat with us about uh, some of her experiences. So firstly, yep. um, can you tell me a little bit about your role at Canva and what makes Canva a great place to work for you? Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks for having me, first of all, Dan. Um, so my role at Canva is a tech lead, and uh, there are a few things to being a tech lead at Canva. One is, uh, the engineering side of things, where uh, we review a lot of code, we review a lot of design docs, 
the other side of it is the people side, um, which is we call we call them engineering coaches. And that is basically a personal development uh, role where you are helping other engineers develop their career and uh, grow within Canva as well as grow to become um, stronger engineers in general. So yeah, that is my role here at Canva. Uh, what makes Canva a really good place to work? There are lots of things that make Canva a really good place to work. Um, one of them is the welcoming environment. Um, everybody is welcome here. We, um, the, you, you will see a lot of people here who are uh, very funky, very weird and wacky and fun in their own ways. And uh, that is amazing, I think. That is well, part of the thing that makes Canva so awesome. I have not seen that in any other place uh, that I've worked at so far. Uh, the other part of it is uh, the growth opportunities that you have at Canva. Uh, it's a very fast growing company, which means that there are, there are more opportunities than there are people. So if there is anything that interests you, um, there's al the doors are always open to go and try that out uh, and explore that opportunity. Uh, so yeah, those are some of the things that make Canva pretty awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. We were talking last night um, before the event about uh, kind of this, this this idea of diversity and very often people think of diversity as being their gender or or, mm -hmm. or ethnic background or sexuality but actually you had a you had some some finer points to add to that about different ways of thinking about diversity can you can you share with me a little bit about that yeah definitely so uh, what I think the way I think of diversity is not just gender or sexuality or ethnicity uh, there are lots of things to diversity including things like did you go to university? Did you finish school? <laughs> How old you are? Um, there, and there are things like um, whether you uh, are struggling with mental illness, for example, and therefore maybe you need to take a day off now and then. And things like that uh, contribute to that um, term diversity to me. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's what I mean when I say diversity. Uh, it's wider than just appearance or uh, gender. Mm, so bearing that in mind, how how do you ensure that everybody feels welcome? You know, we talked about inclusion, but but belonging almost is sort of that extra level. How, how do you think mm. about that? Yeah, so inclusion, like why I don't have anything against the word inclusion, but I think it's only the first step. The goal that we want to achieve is where everybody feels uh, welcome and everybody feels like their voice is heard and they feel like they are treated fairly. So to foster that environment, I think one of the important things to do is to leave judgment outside. Uh, we are a team, we're here to do things together. So uh, having a judgmental or critical attitude uh, all the time is not very helpful. Um, and therefore, what is really crucial is when uh, you're giving feedback, being objective with the feedback, having specific examples of why you have this feedback um, and just bringing it back down to being objective while also being very empathetic with the person. Uh, sometimes the feedback that you're giving can be quite harsh, so it's important to soften that tone with empathy because the goal here is to help the team and help each other. Uh, the goal is not the criticism or the feedback itself, it's the goal is to grow. When um, people realize that you, you are aligned and you actually have the same goals, and that yes. you, you find that changes things for people? Yes, exactly. So I've found people to be very, very open and welcoming of feedback when it's presented to them in this objective way uh, with empathy. Um, and they can tell that you are on their side. We're all on the same side and we're all trying to grow together. So I've found people, it's surprising because the first time I tried it, I was a bit scared <laughs> but it is surprising how welcoming people are to that can you think of any examples where that hasn't worked before or, or or flipping that around where you where you found it has worked effectively yeah so i'll start with a case where it didn't work um i was on the receiving end of some very um i would say biased <laughs> feedback and while i was trying to be objective in this situation i felt like the power was just very skewed and I had no power at all. So um, I felt very, I felt powerless. I felt like I couldn't do anything about it even though I was trying to be objective from my side. Um, and unfortunately there wasn't a very good end to this situation because um, I ended up leaving. So um, there wasn't a very good end to this particular situation. Yeah. 
Uh, but what worked well, uh, like I was saying before, very recently, I had to give some pretty harsh and difficult feedback to somebody. Um, and I was really skeptical, uh, sorry, not skeptical. I was very nervous going into it because I was worried of what, what this feedback would have, what impact this would have on the other person. Um, so this being objective and having a lot of empathy and just the tone of voice that you use and everything, uh, softening it down, softening the harsh feedback down uh, with objective examples really helped. And the person was very objective very um, open to this feedback and they took it on board and I saw a real positive change in them. So uh, yes, I, I've, ha I've seen it work really well and it's really amazing when it does. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, any, any parting thoughts, any advice you'd share with the group about how to, in, in particular, how to make the conversations with, you have with your team members more objective? Like, What are some of the things that you can think about when you're going through that process? Yep, so I think one, one of the things that I would say is uh, sometimes it's easy to get emotional and just have kind of an emotional reaction to things, whether that is, um, uh, I don't like this person, or, oh, I, oh my God, this person is amazing, I want to try and help them. So taking a step back from that hype, super emotional reaction to just paring it down to the basics of why is this person saying this thing? Why are they doing this thing? And trying to understand uh, the objective of what they're saying or doing. Um, and then, yes, the, and then trying to be objective from there rather than going first with the emotional reaction. Understood. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all say thank you to Paul Wynn for sharing her thoughts. So we're going to jump uh, straight into uh, the next trailer. Now, hopefully, we'll have some audio this time. Fingers crossed. And uh, no. <laughs> My name's Dan Draper. I'm a 30-something white male. I've been programming computers since I was 13 years old. But over the years, I've noticed most of the coders and engineers I work with are just like me, white and male. In fact, in my first year of university, in a class of over 300 students, only six of the students were women. But why is that? I mean, the first computer scientists were mostly women. Ada Lovelace, Grace Hopper, Francis Allen, and many others. But somewhere along the line, diversity in computing went backwards. And today, only 6% of leadership roles in technology are held by women. It might have something to do with the timing that video games appeared. I always did kind of enjoy playing video games, but was kind of like, this is for my brother. Like, I was, a, I was also like a little embarrassed that I enjoyed playing video games. People use negative terminology, like they use things like, oh, well, if you're in science or math, you must be a nerd. If you go into a class and say, we're going to learn to code today, no one bats an eye. No one's like, wait a minute, is this a thing that four boys or four girls? Kids don't say that. You can't be what you can't see, right? So it's important for women to see other women succeeding in the professions that they want to pursue. Diverse teams create better products. Diverse teams are more successful. Diverse teams are more profitable. So we have to do something now so we don't let these kids fall through the gap. Since 2014, I've traveled across the US and Australia and conducted over 40 interviews. Our debugging diversity team have attended dozens of events and captured some truly inspiring moments. But now we need your help to finish what we started. We've assembled a crack team of industry experts and filmmakers. And with your help, we can make this dream a reality. Please contribute to our campaign and help us in debugging diversity. Alrighty, so on to our uh, main event. We're asking the question, is inclusion enough? Admittedly, I feel like this might be a little bit of a loaded question, but we're going to tackle it nonetheless. <laughs> so let me uh, introduce you to our panelists. So firstly, uh, to my left is Emma Jones, who's founder and CEO of Project F. A round of applause, please. <laughs> uh, Melissa Norton, who's a tech recruiter at Talenza. 
Uh, and we've got Claire Tran, who's an engineering manager at Expert 360. Fiona McCauley, who's, so who's a, also at Expert 360 as a software developer. Uh, Sophie Troy, who's a tech lead at VAMP. And uh, Kiki Abagunde, who's a customer engagement exec at SAP. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So let's start um, with uh, our first question. Um, Emma, I want to start with you, actually. You've um, done a lot of work on this space over the years. Yep. Um, when companies say divers diversity and inclusion, what do they mean? Uh, a, a quite a good way to explain that is um, diversity means everyone's invited to the party, and inclusion means that everyone feels comfortable enough to dance. So uh, in the co context of work, at the workplace, we're talking about having a diverse group of people, um, which we now know make far better problem solvers, um, enables a company to innovate faster, and so on. Um, but the inclusivity part of it, and inclusion is different to diversity, is more about that acceptance and respect and feeling valued um, no matter what your differences are. So whether it's ability, whether it's physical ability, whether it's religion, whether it's race and ethnicity, um, gender, identity, and so on. I understand Project F recently conducted a survey about what women prioritize in technology. We did. Um, can you share with everybody what your findings were? Yeah, it was really interesting, actually. So we, uh, we wanted to validate this conscious kind of um, sense that women who work in technology experience the world of work very differently to women who work in non-technical roles or non-technology specific roles. So if you're in HR, if you're in finance, whatever, you're going to have a very different experience of the working environment because you're unlikely to be isolated as a minority, whereas women working in tech, quite often they're the only woman on the team and so on. So, um, and there are some other uh, contributing factors. And the survey, we, we just basically only sent it to women who um, were working in technology roles specifically, so engineering or data science or whatever. And um, it was very different. So their experience um, compared to the surveys that show what other women uh, value um, and as most priority, highest priority, um, was different. Mainly that it's not so much about family. So it's not that they don't value those things. It's that there are other things that are more important to them in the workplace or they, they value more um, specifically because of how they're experiencing work. So like pay equity was probably the, was the number one, uh, where it, it's not the number one for women working outside of that because they don't have as big a pay gap. Women in technology have, uh, the pay gap is 7% higher than it is in the general uh, pay gap. Um, so that's one of them. And the, and the career development, again, we talked about, you know, the bias that can come into reviews and it's how people get, get promoted. So again, it's different for women in tech because typically they're an underrepresented minority. So this, the main findings were that there is a disparity between um, the experience of women at work and what they value. Um, and what and people who are not women who are not working in technology and unfortunately what happens is that most diversity and inclusion programs and initiatives run by companies don't take that into account so it's about fairness across an entire company and organization so the the, the um, priority that is put on uh, women in general will not necessarily have the same effects for those women working in technology environments that's really interesting let's jump over to Kiki um, you're working in a, in a much larger organization, I think, than anyone else on the panel, SAP, one of the biggest companies in the world. How does, how does SAP, in your experience, think about DNI, uh, diversity and inclusion, and what has worked, what hasn't worked f for you and your personal experience? Um, so yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, SAP is a global organization of about 98,000 um, plus uh, employees, which spans over 140 countries globally. Um, and when we think about diversity and inclusion, we actually have an office um, and chairs um, globally as well as regionally who look after uh, the subject matter. And more recently, the effort has been to break down um, those barriers and break down regional nuances and have a global, um, 
a global program and a global inclusivity program. And when we think about inclusivity, um, it's not just on the basis of gender, it's not just on the basis of ethnicity or race um, or even age, it's um, in terms of abilities. So one of the programs um, and one of the initiatives that's undertaken globally um, is a program called Autism at Work. Um, and it's targeted at people who learn differently um, and have different abilities. That isn't to say that they can't perform adequately um, or you know, really above what a baseline expectation would be, but it's making certain that across the board, um, everyone can be included. Uh, you asked about what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, so as you can tell from my accent, uh, I'm not from Australia even though I consider myself Australian. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the, the benefits of working for a global organization is that two years ago, I got the opportunity to relocate to Australia. Um, I've actually been with SAP for about seven years now in a multitude of roles. Um, I've done tech project management. Um, I've also done a stint as an implementation consultant. So I've gotten to see different facets of the business. Um, and I've also gotten to see different facets of different regions. And one of my first initiatives when I got here was to go to my boss and say, oh my god, what are you guys doing about diversity? And you're not doing enough because everyone looks the same to me. <laughs> um, very American approach. <laughs> uh, and, and one of the initiatives that I undertook um, was just having our customers in a room and um, talking about my experiences uh, that I've had working with men um, and working within other enterprises, so outside of my company, uh, and trying to take that regionally. Uh, and unfortunately, in Singapore, I, I thought we could you know, lift and shift the same approach. Didn't quite go as well, <laughs> and the message kind of fell flat. So um, for me, you know, thinking and having this linear view of what diversity is, what it means to be inclusive, um, just you know, going eight hours away by plane, um, you know, I, I came to realize that you know each region has its own nuances, and what is of concern here may not be of concern uh, in a different area. So it, it forced me to really take a step back. Um, and, and take a different perspective. And then uh, another one of the lessons that I learned from having relocated to Australia is that um, oftentimes we are excluded uh, when it comes to everything. So this is even outside of the realm of DNI. Um, we're talking global meetings. They're at like 2 a.m. Australia time. It works for everybody else, but no one cares that you know we're literally <laughs> in the middle of the night uh, the next day. The reason we're here all for breakfast is so that we could be 2.30 p.m. San Francisco time. <laughs> yeah. Case in point. Yes, yes, precisely. So um, as you and I discussed last week, um, when I really start to think about it at a more macro level, um, inclusion has so many more facets um, and so many more aspects than we might consider um, than what is generally um, taken into account. So that's been my experience. Understood. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So the, the Project F survey professional development was listed as the number two item. Um, uh, what I'm curious to know is how can managers provide this effectively to the team? So Claire, I wonder if we could start with you being an engineering manager. How do you think about that? Well. Um, Career discussions is something that I have quite often with the team. Um, and I think empathy plays a big part in this as well. Every individual is different and every individual has a different path and different career aspirations. So you might want to take a step back and just ask them, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And then from there, you want to fill in the gaps and you want to say, hey, um, you know, we, we will identify together what are the gaps, where do they want to grow? and then put together a plan on that, rather than, um, I guess it's, it's individualised per person. So you're trying to um, give each person a fair go, I suppose, and tailor it to them. So like I said, empathy is the key, and uh, it's just a really thoughtful approach. Um, I'm currently working on something right now, which is like a skills matrix, and that's hopefully going to drive these conversations uh, in a more productive way as well. Have, have any of your experience as um, being a team member translated into how you think about being a manager? Or have you kind of shifted your, or done something different to what previous managers have done because of experiences? I think it's definitely shaped um, a lot of the thinking that I have now. So there's been good examples and not so great examples. Um, 
and I so I do try to draw some inspiration from the good examples. Um, and you know, when I think of uh, the good examples, things like stretch projects really helped me. For instance, Stre stretch projects. Stretch projects, and it doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, just being able to have that opportunity does help. Um, I have been in a situation before where I felt like I was pigeonholed, um, and it was like you're a developer and this is what you do, and uh, that wasn't something that resonated very well with me. Um, so I try not to do that with people, and try to go back to where do we, where do you want to go, and let's try to get you there. Um, and I think one of the biggest learnings, and it sounds really obvious, and I've mentioned it before, is like empathy, having empathy for different people. Because everyone's different and everyone has a different journey and different background. Thank you. Sophie, you're a, you're a tech lead at VAMP and, and you're, you have people responsibilities. What are some of the things that you've um, either seen or used yourself to, to help team members feel welcomed? Yeah, so I, I can tell you what I've seen and what I think is actually effective. Um, right. So, I think so, so, so the implication is that not everything you've seen is effective. Yeah, I think when people <laughs> Say, oh, like particularly if you have a new starter and they're like, oh, let's welcome them to the team. The first thing people think of is having a team event or some kind of a bonding activity. Um, and that's great, but having one hour of fun time is just window dressing if the other 39 hours of the week are awful. <laughs> so it's really about that day to day. Your day to day work environment has to be really positive. So I'm not saying don't do team activities, I think they're great, but you just need to be conscious that. People have different ideas of what is fun. And also people have different commitments outside of work. And I don't just mean children, it could be caring for a parent or maybe a second job. Like you don't know people's personal situation. So it's really important when doing these team activities that they're in work hours, especially for me. Like I think something like a team lunch or an afternoon activity is great. But Friday night drinks to me are actually quite an exclusive <laughs> activity. But just going back to my other point around the day to day, if you want, I think, for someone to feel welcome and supported in a team, what's important is to have clear expectations on both sides. Mm. I think a lot of anxiety comes from uncertainty, particularly for someone who's just starting out in their career. So I think here is like, as a practical example, if I had a new starter joining my team, you know, on their first day I'd sit down with them and make clear to them how long I expect the induction process to take, when they might expect to start on a real sprint task, um, that I, you know, when I will be checking in with them, and also that I'm available for questions whenever they need. So they're just removing that uncertainty for them. They, they have a clear idea of what's going to happen in the short term. But also going forward as, as people progress in their career and having those check-ins, it's about making sure they understand your expectation of them and you understand their expectation of you, what they need from you. Um, I think there could easily be a culture of, oh, if nothing's wrong, we don't need to talk. But that basically means the only time you talk to your boss is that when something's wrong, <laughs> which is actually not a good relationship. So yeah, I think um, very much for me, it's about setting those expectations on both sides. And that's how I, someone feels supported, by knowing the lay of the land, I think. When we were talking earlier, um, you were saying that one of the challenges you've had coming to a smaller organisation is that you kind of, from a larger organisation to a smaller organisation, you, you realise that you sort of almost took a bunch of stuff for granted, and you, you know, onboarding programs or, or professional development plans or whatever. Can you tell, me, tell us a little bit about that and some of the challenges you've had and, and what role you've played in, in getting that stuff sorted? <laughs> yeah, so I, I came from previously a very large global tech company, which had um, around 600 engineers worldwide, um, but just a small satellite office in Sydney. Um, and there's something to be said for large company that they do have sort of policies and procedures in place which you can draw on. Um, and when I was first learning to interview for um, junior roles, you know, I could sit in on someone else doing it and see how they did it. There was, you know, a set of criteria. Um, and then I came to Van, which is a startup, and had an engineering team of 10. And it was a huge difference. And in fact, the first time I had to give a technical interview at Van, I had to write it because there wasn't one. Um, similarly, with we had a new starter start two weeks ago, um, I had to write the induction process because there wasn't one. Um, and I think it's important to do these things because, for one, already um, our new starter has given feedback that she's like, oh, it's so great to have things written down because I know what I need to work on. Um, 
But I think also it's, again, it sort of goes back to just making it clear what people need to do. Um, but it has been a challenge to me because I found, um, you know, obviously not everything's going to be in place and not everything's going to be perfect. So I had sort of a personal lesson around learning to be flexible um, and also uh, having to draw on other members of the team as well. Um, so I think that's that been good um, in that sense. But I think also when you talk about career progression and sort of talking about what Emma was saying, sorry, um, the, about having that skill matrix, those things aren't in place yet. So we have to build them. And I think that was a really good thing in my other previous job. Global companies do have these job descriptions, which I, help, I think helps in terms of equity, because it takes the opinion away from any promotion decisions. It, it almost acts like a checklist. Mm. Um, and so it just means that it sort of removes an element of bias, but also it's powerful for the employee as well because they can go in and say, look, I've ticked these things off, you know, here are my examples, I should be promoted. So that helps, you know, mm. Paul, when earlier was talking about this, this idea of objectivity, how can you be objective if you don't know what the, you know, what the expectations are on yeah. that side? So that, that allows you to, to, to do that. Yeah, exactly. that's great, thank you. Um, let's go to Fee now. So, so Fee, you've, you've uh, come to a technology career later on in your, in your career and you've made a switch. You've been in technology for a couple of years now. How important has it been for you through that process to have role models, particularly female role models? Um, yeah, really important. I think that, um, I, when I was going through General Assembly, a lot of the people that I looked up to, uh, so alumni that had been through, uh, they were all female. Um, and to see them out in the workforce and achieving what they have uh, was very inspiring. Mm. But to say that, uh, I also feel gender uh, doesn't mean, isn't the be all and end all because uh, I have a lot of male role models as well um, and male uh, people in tech that I look up to is, uh, that I find inspiring. That's great, yeah. Um, so let's go to, um, I, was, I was expecting a longer answer. Sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can, can you tell us a little bit about what made you switch into technology? What, what, what was it that, that prompted that? Yeah, so uh, I was in, um, I actually started off doing AV work uh, and then moved into an IT support role. Um, and I moved into, uh, wanted to do engineering because I wanted to create stuff instead of uh, being there putting out fires all the time. Um, but as you know, as an engineer, still that's, putting pies. Yeah, I'm still putting out fires every day. But um, yeah, I feel like it's a, it's a lot more creative. Uh, and just seeing something that you've uh, coded out there in the world with people just pressing a button and, and doing something with your work is, um, is amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, I mean, it's the best industry in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's uh, we'll go on to Claire now. And I'm, I'm, Mel, I haven't forgotten you. I'm getting to you. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that is often talked about is, is, you know, talking about role models is the idea of a, a mentor or a champion. Mm. Uh, can, you, can you explain to people what a mentor or a champion is, maybe if there's differences and, and how people can think about doing that effectively? So it's, I think... People use mentor and champion interchangeably, but they can be different people, actually. And, um, you know, what I think, like sometimes you're lucky and it's the same person, but sometimes it's different people. So a champion is probably someone who's, when you're not in that room, they're championing you. And they're saying, you know, Fee's so great, like she does this, this and this, and like she deserves this whatever reward. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a mentor is like they're with you day to day or a bit more often where they're checked into what you're doing and where you're going and giving you advice um, and I think you know there are different places where there are formal programs but you can also find them in the community I believe Project F has like mentoring. a prog mentoring program right now yeah um, and there are different places where you can find them. I think it's helped me a lot in my career as well because sometimes you're sitting in your environment but you need to bounce off somebody else or get advice or opinions. And then having that champion puts projects in your way or opportunities in your way. I've, I've been in a situation where I was um, in a team with men and I just didn't feel like my voice was heard. 
but there was an architect and someone else who I'd never worked with. Well, I mean, I did, but not, they're not in my team. But they, they championed me and said, oh, I think Claire deserves to be on the platform team because of X, Y, Z, and I got that opportunity. So that's, that's helped me with my career, for instance. Mel, one of the things I hear often when, when talking about inclusivity and, mm. and gender diversity and so forth is, particu and I particularly get this question from male hiring managers, how do we hire more women? Yeah. As a recruiter, yeah. um, you know, that's, it, it's, I guess, somewhat of an oversimplification of the, of the problem, but, but mm. how, how do you respond to a question like that? So I think there's a number of things that hiring managers could be doing to, I guess, in that sense, work with recruiters on this. Um, the first is definitely market knowledge. So um, I don't know how many of them are aware of, um, you know, how, how there isn't so many women in technology. And so saying to me, um, you know, we want a short list and we want a short list. We want it to be 50% women and 50% male. It, it's not always feasible because the talent's not there, you know, particularly in software engineering. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a skills uh, short market as it is at the moment, let alone throwing in the gender piece as well. So it's about, I guess, educating them on that and, and pushing back and, and sort of, um, you know, letting them, letting them know about the market and what it actually looks like. Yeah. So I'll ask you this question then, and, and then perhaps I'll throw it to the, to the group for, for other, other views. But, you know, this idea of 50-50, mm -hmm. it, it's a, is it a unicorn? Is it, is it helpful to even think about this 50-50 or, or is it more, of, more problematic? Yeah, that is a difficult one because I think it is good to have people thinking about diversity and getting more women involved in technology, but then at the same time, it's should women be a quota, you know? It's almost like more demoralizing if you've been hired just because you're the woman as opposed to actually what your skills and experiences are. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, it's kind of the chicken and the egg type question. Um, you know, I just think that um, getting more people aware of the subject matter and, and understanding the, um, I guess, the issues that we're facing in this sense is the most important part. Um, and then, you know, if we, can, if we can get male leaders in particular, because it is such a male dominated industry to champion this um, change, if you like, and really sort of feed it downwards, it's all about a mindset, I guess. Um, you know, it's all about changing the mindset and bringing in, um, you know, people of, like we've said, across diversity, not just, not just gender, um, but wanting to work with the best in business, not necessarily, oh, we'll, we'll bring this person in because she's female and we're ticking a quota. Yeah. Emma? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's more about a retention approach than it is. So hiring is, everybody in tech will generate, not everybody, um, but leaders in tech will often blame the pipeline. That's probably the most common thing I hear is there's mm -hmm. just no pipeline. If more women applied to my jobs, I'd hire them. Well, it's not that. It's what Dan talked about earlier, this 41% of women leave. And actually, the total number is something like 56, but you take out the ones that do go and have families, and yes, they should be able to return. There's, you, know, you don't leave a job. You leave, these people are leaving industries um, mm -hmm. to do something else. So it's about stemming that flow, because you can hire as many as you like, but if they're all going to leave after five, six, seven years and go and do something else, you're never going to solve the problem. It's a leaky bucket. That's my, probably my biggest take on that is, um, and I think with regards to recruiters, um, recruiters are revenue driven. And I did it for years, I know the model. So they have to hire what will bring them in revenue. Um, and so if you're asking them to go and find unicorns, they're gonna go to the stuff that's actually much easier to find, which in this case is men. Um, so they're going to revert to that automatically and they're not going to prioritize your roles. And that's, that's the way the industry works. That's the way it's set up. So it has to be about looking at what's going to make it more women come to your company. Why would they want to come and work there if they're just going to find the same as they find everywhere else? That's going to be a, you know, an, a, a culturally unpleasant environment, um, you know, a frat house of a a place that you're attracting people because you've got a ping pong table. You know, that's the stuff to look at. I don't think you have, you can go to recruiters and beat them and say, 
find us 50% <laughs> female because it's they're just not going to be able, it's just not, it's that you're looking at, you're at the wrong vehicle to make that change. Is that a conversation you have with your clients, Mel? Um, it's funny, it's, yes, it is. Um, I mean, I would, I would completely agree with everything that Emma's just said with regards to what recruitment is and what the industry is. And, um, you know, it is revenue driven. So we are there to, to make money, essentially. It's a sales driven environment. Um, I guess it depends on the individual as well. I know that from my perspective, I would love to get more women involved in software. And if I could send a short list that were all women, even better. Yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely a conversation that I have. And I think there's, as whether people want to admit it or not, unconscious bias is still there. Um, and I have had conversations with clients before where I've said, you know, um, how would you feel if I sent you a short list and I removed the names and I removed, um, you know, even visa status and things, you know, is that, is that something you would take a look at? Because then it's more likely to, um, you know, that they're, they're looking at it based on a skills and experience thing and not a gender or a where, cultural background thing. How is that received when you do that? Um, mixed. Some people are like, yeah, I don't care. Other people are like, oh, no, no, I, no, I don't really, I want, I want to see it. It's, it's kind of so mixed. They, so they do actually want to know yeah. things about the individual. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Not just their skills no. and experience. No, 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 definitely. Um, but yeah, back to, I guess, what, what Emma said, it's, um, it's a difficult one from a recruitment perspective. Um, I think it definitely does come down to, um, you know, why women would want to work for your business. And, you know, those, those, the topic in regards to the ping pong tables and things. If I was looking at a job advert, I'm not going to apply just because it says ping pong tables because I don't enjoy mm. playing ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, so it's about in, in including people as a whole, not just generally um, you know, picking out, oh, we've got a ping pong table and, and whatnot. Catering to everybody. Yeah. Not not just um, the stereotype of a, an engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We talk about rock stars and ninjas far too often in our industry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kiki, I'm going to pick on you. Um, okay. <laughs> we've <laughs> I had we've a been talking about a number of interesting related topics today. Yeah. Is inclusion enough? I mean, broadly, no. Um, but also to really be able to answer that or at least start uncovering it, you really have to have a good firm idea of what inclusion is um, and what it means. And in uncovering what that looks like, you really have to be not only receptive enough, um, but open enough to pick other people's brains. Um, one of the examples that I shared with you uh, around this topic of having, you know, a more diverse candidate pool from which to choose, you know, potential people to fulfill roles within your organization um, was with one of my colleagues where I, you know, was just very assertively, difficult to imagine, um, <laughs> stating that I felt that, you know, our, our respective group could benefit from more women, from purely having more females in the business. And um, there was great offense taken to that. Um, and I was just completely gobsmacked that he couldn't understand from my perspective. Um, and the perspective um, that I was really forced to start mulling over was the fact that there are people who have the opinion um, that simply because someone is female um, doesn't mean they're the best person for the role. Whereas there are actual statistics that prove that women um, will only apply for a job for which they feel almost 100% certain they can fulfill every single one of the requisites listed within a, you know, a, a job posting. Whereas men, I think it's something like, you know, if they, if they meet like 40% of it, they're like, dude, killed it. Like, I got this, I got this in the bag, <laughs> like nailed it. Um, and to go along with that, actually, um, I, I don't know what publication undertook this particular survey. But when men were surveyed about whether or not they felt comfortable um, and knowledgeable, actually, about breastfeeding, the percentage of men who responded that they felt that they could confidently breastfeed a child was higher than how women rank themselves. So just give you, you know, to give you a perspective of that. So, you know, his perspective that, you know, don't you think it's a disadvantage to women to, you know, promote a woman into a role for which she, you know, may or may not be qualified? I'm like, actually, not really. But... If I'm delivering a message to someone, I now have to take that into account, right? Because I don't want to exclude people who could potentially be drivers behind change, right? 
Um, so that was just something that, that I, you know, I shared with him. So when I think about inclusion, I also think about really understanding and digging um, at different viewpoints. And regardless of whether or not I agree with them, and for the record, I don't, um, <laughs> being able to at least understand that perspective so that when I'm you know, proffering recommendations or when I'm having these conversations in the course of business, I can take and present my position from a different viewpoint. I, I saw an article recently, there was um, a survey done of men uh, about playing tennis against Serena Williams. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I think one in eight said that they could, they could easily win, uh, get a point against Serena Williams. I, I, have they never seen this one? <laughs> I, mean, quite I, frankly, I play a bit of tennis and there's absolutely no way. <laughs> Um, quite frankly, there's something also, um, at least from my perspective, to be garnered from that level of confidence uh, that I could just go in there and do it. Um, and I was really, one of the benefits of working for a large organization is, is we come by a lot of professional development opportunities. So um, around this time last year, I was selected and a group of about 15 of my um, colleagues from all over Asia Pacific and Japan um, to go out to Singapore and do take part in a two-day seminar um, that was targeted at developing female leaders. And the woman who delivered the course was spectacular. And one of the first things that she told us was that um, men overwhelmingly will just go out for a position for which they either are clearly not qualified for, um, maybe aren't fully aware of what the um, uh, you know, what the role fully entails. And what shocked me as a former consultant <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a former um, developer, if you will, was that men will actually ask to be taken off of less visible projects and placed onto one that's visible. And you just, there was an, a, sh a hush that fell across the, the entire room and we were all like, oh, you can, you can do that? <laughs> like that that's, that's a possibility. You know, it, it never really entered our consciousness. So, um, you know, when I, when I think about inclusion and when I think about, um, you know, progression in many ways, I also try to think about, like, if I were a guy, would I be sitting here for two weeks mulling over, you know, what this job entails? You know, can I do it or not? Like, what if I fail? What will people think? And instead, just kind of go for it and say, all right, well, if I fail, it's a lesson learned, um, but what if I succeed? You know, and what if I am the best man you know, for the job? So, something yeah, to consider. It's fascinating, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, I've, I've experienced that uh, amongst my male colleagues especially, that, that, and, and as I've explored this topic in particular and getting to hear the stories of more women, I'm realizing just how, how often that, that does seem to occur, which is interesting. So I think at this point in time, let's switch to the audience. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panelists? Then I'll jump at once. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Uh, any parting remarks from anyone on the, on the, on the panel? Fee, uh, is inclusion enough? Oh, sorry, I cut someone off. Um, no? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, inclusion to me is that I'm able to bring my whole self to work every day and not second guess anything that I say. Um, and also, I think that you hit the nail on the head about diversity isn't just gender, age, sexuality. It's about your background. So not necessarily everyone has a computer science degree or, mm -hmm. you know, you might have mental health issues. And um, I think that they're equally as important. Um, I've been in a uh, recruitment event where there was, say, 20 people. And out of those 20 people, I was the only one that didn't have a computer science degree. And that didn't feel real comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. um, everyone had the same background. Uh, everyone did computer science, just finished and they're out in the workforce. Um, and so what I find of most value in my, the places that I want to work at is the people that I work with are from different backgrounds, are different ages, um, because you draw so much inspiration from that and the collaboration is, is a lot better in those types of environments. Mm. Emma Jones, I feel, like, I feel like of all people Always. I should ask this question. <laughs> Always. Um, I think the, one of the most important things for people to keep in mind uh, when they think about inclusion um, is that is this number of women that are exiting. So we talk about pipeline. Think about why there is a pipeline problem. The reason why there's a pipeline problem is because girls aren't choosing these careers naturally. And the reason they're not choosing these careers naturally, or one of the main reasons, is because they can't see themselves in those careers. They can't look up and see themselves. Boys can, girls can't. 
So until we fix that, until we remove the barriers to women remaining in and progressing and developing mm -hmm. their careers, that's not going to change enough. So all the work that's being done at that pipeline end to get girls interested in STEM, which is still minimal and fledgling, that will, on its own won't be enough. We need to have more women making it through that midpoint of their career than currently are, way more. And that means focusing on retention and development of women, making sure that not only we bring them in, but we keep them and we develop them and we move them through so we can start seeing a, a much bigger layer of females beyond that mid-tier where they currently disappear. In the spirit of the, the inclusion topic, I've, I'm going to ask everyone on the panel, Mel, is inclusion enough? So it's a, yeah, it's a big, it's a big question. Um, I mean, speaking from, from personal experience, um, it's funny because um, you wouldn't necessarily think in recruitment that it is a, a male-dominated industry, and it's not, but in specific pockets it is. Um, and particularly um, in our organization, we're obviously technology recruitment, and it kind of, kind of feeds into that as well. Um, and we do have, um, I would say, more, more male staff than we do female staff, but um, we are... Um, I guess, changing that. Um, and I think that comes down to the women that are in the business already and how we attract other women. Um, so I think that, you know, in order to, in order to, to change that and to, to make inclusion um, a thing, um, not just necessarily for gender, um, you know, like Fee said, to come and turn up to work every day and, and feel like you, um, it, it, it's really important and businesses need to focus on that. Um, and I think we actually, as a business, do that quite well. I had a conversation with my manager at, the, um, at my yearly um, appraisal, and he said, you know, why do you enjoy working for us? And it's because I can come to work every day, and, you know, I am a little bit weird, and I'm a little bit out there at times, and I can be myself, and it's accepted. Um, so I think if businesses can, um, can build an inclusive culture for everyone, across every aspect of who they are as a person, not just because they're female or, you know, because of their ethnicity or whatever, then yes, I'd say that we, we you know, it, it is enough. Um, but getting to that point is, is, yeah, is the part that needs, needs the work. That's the challenge. Yeah. Claire? Um, it's, it's hard work, I think. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that play into it you know, policies, culture, environment, support, growth, all of that ties into it. Um, and I think also when you do have a good environment, people know about it. And people who are shopping around, so what, the last time I shopped around for a job was for Expert 360, and I chose it because I looked at a few factors and culture was one of them. And I think having female founders was something that also made me think, oh, this is, this is going to be amazing because there are role models that are female out there for me. Um, but it's, it's a hard problem. So I think just for companies, don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves and put in that work because there is a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done for everybody. Sophie. I think uh, sort of going back to your point around inclusion is not enough. It's about belonging. And I think a lot of female <coughs> software engineers, you know, have faced this situation and I have in my own past career of not only being the only woman on the team, but potentially the only woman in the office, which has happened to me. And that is incredibly isolating. Um, it's also, I think, again, with these 41% of women leaving tech in the middle of their career, this is when you're moving forward into like a line management role. And again, you might not have any peers on your level or no other female peers. And as things stand at the moment, women do face different challenges in the tech workspace. And if you don't have anyone else to talk to about these challenges, or like, oh, I've got to deal with this difficult, I've got to have a difficult conversation with my junior, how do I approach that, and get advice and feedback on how to face some of these challenges, again, it can just make working in that position much, much harder than it needs to be. And it's so, it's about, for me, I think providing that support and that sense of belonging 
at that midpoint of the career. Um, when you actually start to face harder challenges than just tech. Like coding is easy. Mm. It's everything else that's hard. Yeah. I agree, yeah. Um, so today we asked the question, is inclusion enough? Clearly it isn't, but the solutions are much more nuanced than, than maybe many of us realise. And so I think everyone should be taking away to learn as much about this topic as possible. And I would encourage all the men in the room and those that are watching from the live stream to invest in understanding this topic as well as you can. Uh, I, I hate to pick out men, but it's, it's usually men that don't understand this as well as as they, they could or should. So uh, let's please put a round of applause together for our panellists. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending today's event. Um, apologies, it was a little bit slow getting underway and we, we had to deal with the cold and moving inside. Um, but thank you very much for, for coming along. Um, once again, if you are interested in supporting Debugging Diversity, please visit our Indiegogo campaign. It's debuggingdiversity.com slash campaign. The signs are up on the wall. Um, and once again, thank you all for attending. So cheers.